Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Exploring Reality, where you get to learn about the rational side of the Christian faith and how to share it. In the last video, we talked about uh, just another argument from Jesus mythicists as to why they would think that Jesus is a made-up figure based off of other pagan religions. Now that we're done with mythicist arguments, we're finally going to get into the positive case for a historical Jesus. Throughout this video, we're going to be going over a few different things, and this will probably take some time. I'm going to try to break these up into smaller videos so we don't have a repeat of the last video that lasted almost an hour. So with that, let's get going. First, it's important to talk about historical methodology. History is not like science, where we can sit there and make novel testable predictions and um, run experiments on it, right? History is in the past. We don't have time travel. We can't run back to the past to test a bunch of things. In science, we can run experiments, and we have predictive probabilities based off of those experiments. History is not like that. So, for example, in science, I can throw a ball up in the air, and I will know it'll come down based off the probability of the last 100,000 times I threw a ball up in the air. History is tough because we don't have the luxury of predictive power. For example, we accept the claim that Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address because we have evidence that allows us to make probabilistic inferences to that claim. So when it comes to the existence of a historical Jesus, the mythicists will say there is no evidence, but that comes from a flawed historical methodology, which we'll go over here. So the question now is, what evidence is there? How can we establish a reasonable probability that a historical figure or event actually happened? Whether it's Jesus, Nero, Stalin, Naruto, Goku, Superman, Spider-Man, whatever it may be, there is a methodology we can use to establish whether or not someone actually existed. So let's go over the different types of evidence. We have physical evidence, like photos. It's hard to deny Abraham Lincoln lived since we all have seen photos of him. Someone could have altered the photos in an attempt to rewrite history, and some conspiracy theories actually claim this, not just about Lincoln, but even with things like the Holocaust. But for most of us, the photos are more than enough. Next, we have surviving artifacts or products that can be traced with certainty back to the person. Examples of this are buildings, diaries, etc., etc. For example, Anne Frank left us a diary. So we can conclude she existed because the diary links us to her. Next piece of evidence is evidence that suggests things about a historical person, but isn't from the person themselves, such as references, quotations, or discussions about the person by others. These are the most common types of evidence we have in history. For example, we have lots of documents of people talking about Jesus. So obviously the more evidence we have, the better. And even better if the sources of all the evidence corroborate each other. And yet even better if all the sources of the evidence are also independent of each other. So obviously we don't have photos of Jesus. We also don't have personal writings from him, which is a huge talking point from the mythicists. Many mythicists will use this point as an argument against his existence, but it's flawed in a few ways. One, being that this is an argument from silence, and two, being that, according to historians, we have virtually no first-hand writings from nearly all ancient people in antiquity. Mythicists will also point out that we don't have any non-Christian sources about Jesus' life from the first century. But this point is irrelevant, again, because it's still an argument from silence, and we have tons of people that we accept that existed from that first century that we also don't have first-hand written sources of. The mythicists may argue that Jesus was so spectacular that the pagans had to have written about him. But again, this seems wrong because it's still an argument from silence like we've covered time and time again. As well as failing to understand the low literacy rate of most people during this time. And again, at this point, we're not asking whether or not Jesus performed miracles or not. We're just asking if a man named Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah, was crucified by Pontius Pilate and later on, people said that he rose from the dead. We're not talking about these extra miracles. We're just talking about this man named Jesus. And so it's only after we establish that he existed that we talk about him raising from the dead or performing miracles. Also related to this point, ironically, it's a complete myth 
that the Romans kept detailed records about everybody and that we would expect to have Roman records about Jesus. If Romans kept these records, where are they? We're not only missing those records of Jesus, but think of all the things we don't know about the governor of Pontius Pilate. We know more from the Jewish historian Josephus that Pilate ruled for 10 years between 26 and 36 AD. It would be easy to argue that he was the single most important figure for Roman Palestine for the entire length of his rule. And what records from that decade do we have from his reign? What warrants he signed, his scandals, his interviews, his judicial proceedings? We have none. Nothing at all. And what writings do we have from him? Not a single word. Does that mean he didn't exist? No. He is mentioned in several passages in Josephus and in the writings of the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher Philo and in the Gospels. He certainly existed even though, like Jesus, we have no records from his day or writings from his hand. So with all that out of the way, let's actually dive into the evidence. Let's first go over non-Christian sources. First we have classical sources. Classical antiquity is the period of cultural history between the 8th century BC and the 6th century AD centered on the Mediterranean Sea. Within 100 years of the proposed date of Jesus' death, we have three Roman authors who referred to him. First, we have Pliny the Younger. Pliny was the governor of the Roman province Bithynia Pontus in Asia Minor, or current-day Turkey. He's called the Younger in order to distinguish him from Pliny the Elder, who was more of a scientist of the time. Dr. Bart Ehrman writes, Among scholars of early Christianity, the younger Pliny is best known for a series of letters that he wrote later in life to the Roman emperor Trajan, seeking advice for governing his province. In particular, letter number 10 from the year 112 CE is important as it is the one place in which Pliny appears to mention the existence of Jesus. The letter is not about Jesus himself, it is dealing with a political problem. The long story short, in Pliny's province, a law had been passed making it illegal for people to gather together in social groups. This may seem like an odd law, but it had a very practical function. The Roman authorities were afraid that people in the local might band together for political reasons and that this might lead to armed uprisings. But by forbidding groups from coming together for any purpose whatsoever, the Romans had created a problem, though not one you might expect. The law applied to every social group, including fire brigades. As a result, there was no effective measure in Pliny's province to deal with the outbreak of fires, and so villages were burning. In letter 10 to the emperor, Pliny mentions a group that is gathering illegally. You guessed it right, Christians. Moreover, Pliny informs the emperor the Christians sing hymns to Christ as to a god. Letter 10 is long, so I will quote the main passage here. The Christians were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a god, and bound themselves by a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. After which, it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Historian Robert E. Van Voorst writes, The words, Carmenque Christo quasi de dicere secum invisig, mean, and sung antiphonally a hymn to Christ as if to a god, Harris, following Google, argues that by using quasi, Pliny means to say that the divine Christ, whom Christians worship, was once a human being. Something else that is notable in Pliny's letter, he writes, And then, reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Scholars believe this to be a reference to Jesus' institution of communion and the Christian celebration of the love feast. The reason why is because earlier, Pliny makes remarks of Christians being suspected of ritual murder and drinking blood during the meetings. Obviously, given the Christian doctrine of the Eucharist or communion, Pliny and others outside of the Christian faith could have been using this sort of incredulous rhetoric against them. In summary, we have five main points from this passage. Christ was worshipped as a deity by earlier believers, and Pliny seems to suggest that he was just a man with the words as if to a god. Pliny refers in his letter to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus' ethical teachings are reflected in the oath taken by the Christians mentioned in the letter. 
we find a probable reference to communion, and there's also a reference to the gathering on the Sabbath. All of these lend credence to the belief that there was a historical Jesus and not some person who never existed at all. 